In 2019, the San Francisco Police Department made an announcement. They had DNA evidence thought to be linked to the serial killer they called the Doodler. The police released a digitally aged photo along with a $100,000 reward leading to the arrest of the Doodler. From January 1974 to September 1975, one man was believed to have killed at least six and maybe 14 gay men in San Francisco. From today's vantage point, 1970 San Francisco might have seemed as if it was a sexually freewheeling open city. Compared to most places in the United States, I suppose it was, but that freedom was not without complications and difficulties for the LGBTQ plus community. A decade before this series of murders, San Francisco was rocked by the organized financial shakedown of the gay and lesbian bar owners in the city that exploded into scandal. In February 1960, nine police officers went on trial for their part in a sprawling payola scandal. Police would show up weekly for a cash payoff in exchange for looking the other way and ignoring laws on the books outlawing homosexual activities, such as dancing, touching, kissing. Homosexuality was illegal in the United States in the 1970s, and these and other poison pills were not so much constantly enforced laws, but often used as forms of coercion. Even after the payola scandal, the police could be found openly committing acts of violence against members of the gay and lesbian community. When he owned a shop in the Castro district, Harvey Milk wrote and published an account of two police officers who removed their badges and started a fist fight with patrons of a Castro bar in the middle of the street after the bars closed. In addition to all of those things, there was a rise in fag bashing as it was called at the time, in San Francisco and across the United States in the 1970s. Often the police looked the other way. Harvey Milk and other gay Castro district business owners began to demand that the police take some action to protect their patrons after they left the bars. In response, the San Francisco Police Department became one of the first departments in the United States to form an undercover detail to arrest bashers. The police and the gay and lesbian community began working together to form some sort of bond with baseball games and other public civic activities. But the scars of homophobia were deep, and it would take much more than a few baseball games to penetrate the frost and fear that separated the police from the community. And soon that separation would prove fatal. <laughs> January 27, 1974, at 1.25 a.m., a phone call came into the San Francisco police dispatch reporting a dead body. The body of 51-year-old Gerald Earl Cavanaugh was found at San Francisco's Ocean Beach. According to the police, he was discovered just in time as the tide threatened to drag his body out into the ocean. Cavanaugh had been stabbed 16 times, including defensive wounds, on his left pinky finger. He was fully dressed with $21.12 in his pocket and a Timex watch on his wrist. He had no ID on him, leading the police to identify him as John Doe No. 7. The gay paper, the San Francisco Sentinel, ran a picture of Kavanaugh. Even after he was finally identified, very little was known about him, but I found a fair amount about him. Mr. Cavanaugh was born in Quebec, Canada on March 2, 1923. He was a resident of San Francisco, and he worked in a mattress factory. He was 5'8", 220 pounds. He was Catholic, 
And as the coroner noted, he was never married, a code at the time for being a gay man. Previous to living in San Francisco, he lived, or at least had a mailing address in Potsdam, New York, where he enlisted in the United States Army in 1945 to 1946 when he was discharged. On June 25, 1974, the body of 27-year-old Joseph J. Stevens was discovered by a woman walking her dog along Spreckles Lake in Golden Gate Park. Stevens had been stabbed five times. According to the coroner's report, approximately 10 feet west of the deceased feet was a large disturbed area of brush with a pool of blood. There were drag marks from this point to where the deceased was found indicating that an altercation had taken place. Jay, as he was known, was a very popular female impersonator and comedian in the city. There was blood in Mr. Stevens' mouth and nose. The last reported sighting of him was at the Cabaret Club on Montgomery Street in the North Beach district of the city. I did a little calculation of the drive from North Beach to Spreckles Lake. It would take about 25 minutes. So, Just imagine driving across beautiful, romantically dark San Francisco, falling into a casual conversation, laughing, flirting, driving into the darkness of Golden Gate Park, the air filled with anticipation. There are differing accounts of Stevens' last sighting. One report theorized that Stevens had driven himself to Golden Gate Park. In another report, he had been seen at the cabaret club chatting with a tall, lanky African-American man. Stevens was born in Fort Worth, Texas. He had been named the summer replacement at the wildly popular female impersonator club Finocchio's in North Beach in San Francisco. In an article in The Advocate magazine, it said that Stevens had moved away from female impersonation and was concentrating more on gay comedy at the time of his death. Klaus Christmann, age 31, a recent German immigrant, was found by another dog walker on July 7, 1974. Christmann's throat had been slashed in three places. He was stabbed at least 15 times. He was stabbed in the chest and abdomen. His pockets were torn out of his jacket, and he had one penny in his jean pockets. According to the coroner, quote, the deceased's pants were unzipped and open. The report details the multiple stab wounds, quote, in a manner which seemed as though the assailant had attempted to decapitate the deceased. Inspector David Tusky, a 20-year veteran of the San Francisco Police Department, said that this was one of the most vicious stabbings he had ever seen, and he had been a central part of the Zodiac murder investigations. Like the two victims before him, Christmas, identification was missing. The coroner initially recorded him as John Doe, number 82. According to the Homicide Division Information Bulletin, Chrisman was found with a tube of makeup in his pocket. Detectives noted that Chrisman was wearing a pair of orange bikini underwear. All of these items led the police to conclude that Chrisman had, quote, homosexual propensities. Chrisman may have had homosexual propensities, He also was German, and his choice of underwear was common to men across Europe. We don't know if the makeup was concealer or just lip balm. The problem with law enforcement's black and white thinking about what's what will become more apparent as we go along. Chrisman had been staying with friends for only three months before he was murdered. His family in Germany learned of his death via a curt telegram followed by a brief note from the German consulate in San Francisco that said, Sorry to tell you, Klaus has died. His body was returned to Bamberg, Germany for burial. On May 12, 1975, Frederick Elmer Capen, age 32, was discovered by a hiker behind the dunes that ran along the Great American Highway, also near Ocean Beach. The coroner's note said, quote, There was dried blood smeared on the soles of both shoes, on the hands, about the face, and upper torso, anterior, lateral, and posterior. Like Stevens, Capon was moved 20 feet from where the initial attack had taken place. Capon had no identification and was identified through fingerprints on file due to his work as a nurse. According to Capon's obituary, he was born in Washington State. 
He served in the U.S. Navy from 1963 to 1969, where he worked as a medical corpsman. When he left the Navy, he worked as a nurse. Mr. Capon was the recipient of a commendation medal for saving four men under fire in the Vietnam War. 67-year-old Harold Goulberg was considered by the San Francisco Police Department to be the last victim of the doodler found a little northwest of Ocean Beach. Goldberg was a Swedish immigrant who was discovered in the bushes near the 16th tee of the Lincoln Park Golf Course on June 4, 1975. His body was in an advanced state of decomposition, according to the coroner. He was probably killed two weeks earlier. For the police, Mr. Goldberg's murder differed from the others. Due to his age, he was 67. And the fact that his underwear had been taken and his pants left unzipped made an impression on the police as well. I guess the state of propriety at the time wouldn't allow for the possibility that perhaps Mr. Goldberg wasn't wearing underwear at all. Mr. Goldberg was a member of the Navy where he traveled around the world. I found ship manifests of him in Cuba, Fiji, Yokohama, and Australia. He actually sailed to San Francisco from Australia via Shanghai. The other detail I love is that Goldberg was tattooed on both arms, which was fairly common for folks in the Navy at the time. Five men had been found dead within four miles of each other, all within 18 months. Five months after the discovery of Mr. Goldberg, the San Francisco Police Department released a composite of the suspect. The killer got the name The Doodler from a surviving victim who met the suspect in a bar and restaurant called The Truck Stop. The Doodler was described as a young African-American man who would draw men on a napkin and then approach them with the drawing. The Doodler told the surviving victim that he was a cartoonist. Police described the killer as a young man in his 20s, about 5'11 to 6 feet with a lanky build. It was also noted that the suspect often wore a Navy-type watch cap. In police circles, the doodler was often referred to as the black doodler, emphasizing the race of the suspect. But that soon was dropped for the more catchy name, the doodler. The police said they believed the killer had a quiet, serious personality, with an upper-middle-class background and an above-average intelligence, possibly an art student, which would account for the doodling. Supposedly, he told one of the surviving victims that he was either studying commercial art or was employed as a cartoonist. The police have never released any of the doodles or drawings, so I'm not sure that any of the drawings themselves have survived. The police also indicated that the suspect had a history of mental difficulties involving his sexuality. One of the city's newspapers would go further in stating the killer had sexual identification issues and was undergoing psychiatric care on an outpatient basis. This account would be verified later by detectives on the case. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, the perpetrator said to more than one of the surviving victims, either, you gays are all alike, or you guys are all alike. I think it's more likely that he probably said, all of you guys are alike, because gay was used in the 1970s, but it wasn't nearly as popular and widely used as it is today. While it's clear that the lack of knowledge and the negative attitudes towards the gay community hampered police efforts to solve these murders, it's not entirely the fault of the police. In the 1970s in San Francisco, there was a raft of serial murders that had gone unsolved. In the gay community alone, including the doodler victims, police said that there were 14 to 17 unsolved murders of gay men. A Tenderloin Hotel was the scene of one of the most brutal knife murders of a gay man in a long line of brutal murders in this period. Born in San Diego, former U.S. Corporal Claude Roland DeMott was an unemployed dishwasher living, as the San Francisco Chronicle reported, on welfare in a seedy hotel in the Tenderloin. Homicide inspectors Frank Falzone and Jack Cleary called DeMott's murder overkill. They said it was one of the most vicious murders they'd ever seen. Mr. DeMott had been stabbed 24 times and his genitals had been mutilated. Inspectors said the person they called the suspect had called for an ambulance telling the operator, a boy in the hotel has been stabbed six times. The caller called himself Richard Johnson, telling dispatch, the boy needs help. 
In addition to giving the wrong number of stab wounds DeMott had, the caller told the operator DeMott was on the fourth floor, so it took them a while to find DeMott, who was actually bleeding to death on the fifth floor. Witnesses told police that Mr. DeMott had been seen in the company of a tall African-American man before he was killed. So far, there are two locations where gay men were murdered in a similar fashion. Let's talk about two other locations that confused and confounded the police when it came to making connections in the hunt for the doodler. Very little is known about the South of Market leather scene murders, other than that a number of the victims were stomped or beaten to death and some form of genital mutilation was performed. In a 1975 newspaper article, Lieutenant Charles Ellis said that there were 15 murders with homosexual overtones. Three of the murders occurred at Ocean Beach. Later, the police would attribute five murders at Ocean Beach to the doodler. Ellis said the Ocean Beach murders didn't seem connected because the leather victims were into S&M. He also said all of the leather victims were younger than the Ocean Beach victims. Actually, only two of the five Ocean Beach victims were older, at 51 and 67. Homicide detective Toski told the San Francisco Chronicle, we don't know if we're looking for a guy who hates homosexuals or if he's part of the S&M scene. His comment implies that being into S&M would lead you to be beaten to death or mutilated. Clearly, the police didn't have a framework of understanding for the leather scene at all. Fox Plaza, built in 1966, is a 354-foot, 29-story building. Fox Plaza was one of San Francisco's tallest apartment buildings for many years. It took the place of the legendary Fox Theater that was demolished three years earlier. Fox Plaza's modern design was not beloved by architect critics when it opened, but it was considered a chic new place to live. Today, it shares a Market Street intersection with the Twitter building. Fox Plaza is also the site of three of the Doodler's attacks and possibly one murder that no one talks about. One month after the last Ocean Beach Golden Gate Park murder, one of the most detailed accounts from a survivor of the Doodler comes from a man who the police and news accounts called a diplomat. He was thought to be a Swedish diplomat who was living in the Fox Plaza when one night he met and invited a young African-American man home. According to the diplomat, the young man asked if he had any cocaine, to which he replied, no, I don't. The young man excused himself to use the bathroom where he stayed for about a half an hour. When the young man finally emerged from the bathroom, the diplomat was sitting on the sofa where his assailant began stabbing him. The diplomat was stabbed six times in the back when the knife broke. Somehow he managed to struggle with the man, slamming him against the wall, and the assailant ran off. About a week and a half later, on the same floor of Fox Plaza, the second doodler victim escaped being killed because he screamed so loud that the doodler fled. The screaming victim was tied up at the time. Survivor number three was from Los Angeles. According to police, this person was a very famous actor who was visiting San Francisco where he met the doodler and invited him back to his place in Fox Plaza. According to the actor, as they prepared to get into bed, the young African-American man dropped a knife out of his pocket. They struggled, leading the young man to flee. Those were the three surviving victims the police hoped would help solve the doodler cases, but there is one other possible victim, the fourth, who did not survive his attack. This excerpt I'm going to read you comes from the San Francisco Chronicle, January 19, 1976. Tracing George Gilbert's last few hours found the handsome 32-year-old blonde-haired lawyer was living a double life. By day, he was an assistant trust officer for the Wells Fargo Bank, straight clothes, a high-rise apartment, and women friends with whom he had platonic relationships. At night, though, he came out of the closet. The detective said, all his life, Gilbert was a leather freak, a slave who liked being gagged, tied up on all fours, spanked to the point of orgasm. Can you imagine the police talking about a murder victim that way today? Gilbert was thought to have been seen in a few of the leather bars south of Market, a bartender at one of the bars remembered him as cool, quiet, non-aggressive, a loner. 
A detective is quoted as saying, the only pattern in the killings of the six S&M victims is that they were all passive guys who liked to flirt with danger. The article ends with George Gilbert being found dead by a friend in his Fox Plaza apartment on September 29, 1974. He had been stabbed seven times in the lower part of the stomach. The killer is thought to have ripped Gilbert's leather jacket, pants, and cap. George Gilbert was killed in September of 1974, which was before the attacks associated with the doodler at the Fox Plaza in 1975. Claude DeMott was stabbed to death in his apartment in the Tenderloin in December of 1974. San Francisco's coroner, Dr. Boyd Stevens, summed up the killings by saying, bizarre violence is the rule rather than the exception in gay slayings. Stevens said, they, gays, were all passive masochists who liked flirting with danger. Dr. Stevens went on to say, we're dealing with men who have emotional problems to start with. You can begin to see the problem investigating or establishing patterns with attitudes like these. In researching newspaper articles of the Doodler's active period, I found a couple of murders associated at the time with the S&M murders due primarily to where their bodies were found but they are just as likely doodler murders. And because even recent focus on the serial killer leaves the victims aside, I'm going to include a couple of those murder victims here. Dennis James Dickinson, age 28, was found dead on July 21st, 1975, in a schoolyard near Folsom Street in the south of Market District. Dickinson was born in Michigan in 1947, Like several of the Doodler's victims, Mr. Dickinson was originally identified as a John Doe due to the lack of identification. His identity was found through traveler's checks found on his person. Mr. Dickinson was a painter, and he was only in San Francisco for one month at the time of his murder. One of the strange things about his coroner's report is that it doesn't mention his cause of death even though it states he was murdered and that his death was under investigation. The other murder mentioned in a 1977 article was that of David Reel, 31 years old, born in Ohio, working as a bellhop in a San Francisco hotel. He was found murdered in August of 1975. I couldn't find any other details about his murder. Even if these two men didn't die at the hands of the doodler, I think they are worth mentioning, as they were among a group of gay men, or supposed gay men, whose murders have never been solved and are barely ever discussed. In 1999, the FBI's National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime published Serial Murders, Pathways to Investigation. The study utilized 480 U.S. cases over 46 years of serial murders involving 92 offenders. The study covers a period from 1960 to 2006. There's even a section addressing same-sex serial killings. The study was created to be used as a tool for investigators and police across the country. It was also created to correct some of the misinformation often spread by talking heads on crime shows. It actually says that in the preface. According to the study, there are a few things that might have complicated tracking down the doodler. The study ranks motivations for serial killing, anger being number three. It seems clear from the level of violence and the lack of sexual activity, the doodler's murders were motivated by anger more than sex. Method of killing. You might be tempted to think, oh, knife violence was more prevalent in the 70s and guns are more in use now. But the study covers the 2000s. And stabbing accounts for 12.9% of all methods of serial killing. In 36.9% of the cases, the offender brought his own weapon to commit the murder. The doodler seems to have carried his own knife. Personal items. In 54% of the cases, killers removed multiple items from the crime scene with wallets removed in 23.6% of all cases. IDs were missing from three of the five Ocean Beach Golden Gate Park victims, as well as Dennis Dickinson, whose ID was missing. It's not clear if the IDs were taken as trophies or if they were taken to delay identification, or perhaps the victims didn't have any identification on them to begin with. 
case linkage. This is probably one of the most important takeaways from the study for me. The study says, case linkages of different murders is central to identifying a serial killer. It is paramount to identify the first murder or attempted murder in a series. Similar to other human behavior, the first time an event is performed, the greater the chance for mistakes to be made. These errors can assist in the identification of an unknown offender. This seems like a pretty tough thing to do. After all, you're working backwards to make a link to the first murder. When you add a cloud of homophobia or other presumptions, your ability to judge what you've got is greatly diminished. Now, let's talk a little bit about the suspect. The San Francisco Chronicle, one of the major papers, all but ignored the killings until January 1975, nearly a year after the last Ocean Beach Golden Gate murder. When the murders were finally covered, it led to multiple tips and a number of new suspects. In 1977, the San Francisco Chronicle ran a two-page article featuring Inspector Rotia Guilford, who gave a rundown of the doodler. He said that there were lots of suspects, but the person they liked for the crime was a young man he and his partner had spoken to on several occasions. He said the man spoke freely, talked about his struggles with his sexuality, and how now he had a girlfriend and was no longer dabbling in gay sex. The man fit the profile and the sketch. He lived in Oakland, about 15 to 20 minutes from San Francisco. The inspector said this young man would not confess to the murders. Then something extraordinary happened. In October 1975, a woman called the police telling them a client matched the sketch of the doodler, that this person lived in the East Bay, but her call went into the pile of tips. Ten days later, she called back, angry that they hadn't arrested the guy. This time, she gave them the guy's license plate. This got the detective's attention. Three days after the last call, another woman called, identifying herself as a secretary in a psychiatrist's office. She repeated the same information as the first caller and added the fact that the psychiatrist was treating a man who had confessed to the Ocean Beach murders. Three days after that call, the psychiatrist called the inspectors. He told them that he worked at a hospital in Oakland. He said his patient sought help because he was struggling with self-hatred of his homosexual feelings. The psychiatrist said the patient had made certain admissions about the Ocean Beach killings. Inspector Sanders then talked to the suspect on the phone, where the suspect told the inspector he had been cured and that he now had a steady lady friend. As far as the police know, the suspect is still alive and living in the East Bay. So, there it is. They got him, right? Wrong. There were terrible notes taken about the psychiatrist. In fact, the only reference to him was Dr. Priest at Highland Hospital in Oakland. By the time the police circled back, they couldn't find Dr. Priest or his notes. In 2021, the San Francisco Police Department issued an age-enhanced photo of the suspect, along with an announcement that they had DNA that they believed belonged to the doodler. They planned to use familial DNA to make a match, the same method that was used in finding the Golden State serial killer. The police also announced that there was a $100,000 reward for the capture of the doodler. In January of 2022, the SFPD raised the reward amount to $200,000. Though the police eventually became actively involved in the search for the doodler, it's clear that the history of indifference and hostility towards the LGBTQ plus community hampered their efforts in finding the doodler and the other killings of gay men at this time. As if to further underscore how homophobia silences and kills, most of the names of the gay men who were killed at this time have been wiped out of our collective memory. The people living in San Francisco at the time of these murders were grappling with finding their way, doing all the things, as my grandmother would say, to grow yourself up, only to be crushed under the weight of the HIV-AIDS crisis of the 1980s. It makes me stand in awe, love, and appreciation of people struggling and living, as Alice Walker wrote, in love and in trouble. The struggle for equal rights sometimes can become a bit abstract. That's why I love this quote by Maya Angelou. I think it expresses what we all are striving for. Here it is. The issues 
which face us all are not just how to survive, obviously we are doing that somehow, but really how to thrive, really thrive with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. I would love to hear what you think about the Doodler case. Do you think the case will ever be solved? Do you think the young man the police interviewed is the killer? If you know other gay men who were murdered in this period, please add their names and any details you might have in the comments below. Please like the video and please subscribe to the channel. Thank you for joining me. See you next time.